Hey guys, so uh, this is another video. Uh, it's not going to be long, but we're just going to go through some things. And I'm going to send a Google uh, Doc assignment. I'm going to post it as soon as I finish here. All right, so we're going to talk about how specific sentences, paragraphs, and the larger portion of the text reveal or relates to the whole. All right, so this is your entry ticket. I want you to go ahead. I want you to pause. And then you're going to go to your Google Classroom. And inside of your Google Classroom, you will see this doc. And I need for you to you to uh, fill this out um, and answer the question accordingly. All righty. And then once you do that, you're going to come right back here. All right. So the question is, how does Shakespeare's decision to use a fast pace in telling the story affects the meaning of the drama? And so your learning target is uh, we're going to analyze how the author's structure or how does the author. We will analyze how authors structure a text and manipulate time to affect the tone and you all will be completing a parallel plot diagram of Romeo and Juliet. All right, so this is your activating prior knowledge um, portion here. This is a text. This is an excerpt from uh, Act 2 of Romeo and Juliet. And I want you to take a minute, pause right here, and I want you to answer the question and then come back. All right, so the questions ask, how does the author, which is Shakespeare, set the tone of gloom in this in this particular scene? And so again, you all need to go back to your notes where we talked about tone. And we said the tone is the author's attitude towards a particular subject. Well, in this question, I ask you all, um, about Shakespeare and how he um, how he feels about this particular scene. What's his attitude uh, about this particular scene and how this scene causes gloom? If you look at the sentences or the um, phrases that I have highlighted in blue, uh, as we know, uh, Benvolio has told Mercutio that um, uh, Tybalt has challenged Romeo to a duel, duel. and um, you know, Mercutio is just a little bit concerned. You know, he's like a challenge on my life, and then it was like, hey, Romeo will answer it, and so. Benvolio is thinking about all of the things that he know about Romeo. And then in this particular um, phrase, he said, look, or clause, he is already dead. Romeo is already dead. And so when we see the word alas, alas means unfortunately. So it's like, unfortunately, poor Romeo is already dead. You know, he's stabbed, you know, he's stabbed, he's, he's, Romeo himself has died because of uh, his inability to be with the one that he loves. And we're not talking about Juliet, we're talking about uh, Rosalind, because they still think that, you know, he's in love with her. And so we have these clues, like a challenge on life and, you know how he dares being dared and he's already dead and then we get words like stab and so just these words alone sound kind of gory uh, and so you know it gives us it, it gives us an attitude it it's giving us a hint to shakespeare and how he feels about you know um romeo 
and this whole challenge situation. All right. So again, we're going to talk about structure. At the top, you should see some definitions that I need for you to write down. Again, you know that we're talking about tone, we're talking about the style, we're talking about how something is put together. Think about style, uh, like as far as dressing or like tones of hair. So think about how something is presented, and that's what we're talking about. <clears throat> and more specifically, in writing, we're talking about how the author reveals uh, how he feels or how she feels about a particular subject or uh, about a particular character. Well, now, when we're talking about structure, we're talking about how everything is put together. So we know that in a um, regular literary uh, text that we have a beginning, middle, and end, correct? Or we have the plot diagram and we have the exposition, the rise in action, the climax, the fall in action, and uh, the resolution, right? So that is the typical structure of a tech, of a, a literary piece. So in our piece, the poison tree. My question to you is, how is this put together? What's the structure? How is this put together? Do we have a beginning? Do we have a middle? Do we have an end? I want you to stop and I want you to pause right here. And I want you to try to answer that yourself and then come back. Well, thank you for returning. And yes, um, this poem itself is structured with the beginning, middle, and end. We have um, we have a character. Uh, our character is a narrator. They're telling us uh, what's going on, and um, we also have conflict. There is um, we have two. We have an internal conflict. We also have an external conflict. We know that the narrator was offended by his enemy, and he's holding on to that. Um, and we have things that happen, like events that took place to give us to the climax. And then uh, we have a falling action, and then we have the resolution. And so this uh, particular structure, it took, it took us a long time. A journey. And so my question to you is, how does the author feel about his enemy? And if we were to break this down, like in the beginning, the middle, and the end, how does the author feel about the enemy So, or his enemy? And so we're looking at how this is written and how it is structured, how it's put together, and how it's organized. And this will help us to focus on just the tone. Remember uh, the DIDLS? That will help us. We're looking at diction. We're looking at imagery. And so all of those things that we talked about previously is coming together. Oh, right up in here. You know, again, like I said, we're looking at words and phrases. So when we think about structure, we also need to think about order as you can see right here this picture is uh disorganized and so it's hard for um the man right here in the computer to get anything done it's a, it's a struggle right so that is another component um for structuring the text the authors use a particular a certain type of order and with that order it helps us the reader it helps us to follow along it helps us to understand the theme it helps us to understand the central idea and it helps us to really be able to get in and analyze the characters in the conflict well 
the beginning, middle, and end, or the chronological uh, order, is not the only order. Um, in our case, in Romeo and Juliet, we do have the chronological order. We have um, Act 1, which is all about the beginning. We're learning about the characters. We're learning about the learning about the conflict. We're learning about the setting. All of that's Act 1. We also have what we call a parallel plot. Um, we have two main characters, which is Romeo and Juliet. And each of them have a... They have their own uh, conflicts. They have their own things going on. And then eventually they will merge together. And, they, you know, they come together uh, throughout the text. Also, you guys read a, a, a Long Walk to Water. And uh, that is also a parallel text. Remember, you have Naya's story and then you have Salva's story. And at the end, at the end they came together. And then in our, this, um, in the media Ries, this means in the middle of things. And so this particular order uh, we've seen when it comes to the Odyssey, it started in the middle. You know, we when we started re reading, we learned about Odysseus, what he had already went through. He, we, we came in when he was telling his story about, you know, the things that he'd done and, you know, uh, the episodes that he'd been on. And so it was in the middle so that he could go home. All right. And then we have this uh, particular type of order, circular narrative. You have not encountered this in literature, I don't believe, but it happens a lot in movies. All right. So in addition to the order like the parallel plot the chronological order we also got to think about time we got to think about how the author uses time and these are the ways that he manipulates time you know we got flashback uh foreshadowing flash forwards and all of this help to create suspense so as you're reading we know that uh romeo and juliet will eventually die. We learn that in the very beginning in the prologue. Now, in addition to time, these elements, these literary elements with time, we also have to deal with pacing. And when we're talking about pacing, we're talking about the rate. We're talking about the order and the rate of how something is uh, done. Is it fast? Is it slow? And so these particular things affect the pacing of a text. So we're looking at the action. We're looking at the cliffhangers. We're looking at the dialogue. We're looking at the word choice. We're looking at if these particular events are um, irrelevant are they pushing the story along? Are they creating suspense? Are they creating mysteries for us? If we think about the very beginning of our text, uh, we were immediately hit with um, an altercation. And that altercation helped us to uh, understand how serious this um this 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 brawl or this this well the, that was the brawl but how serious this uh this agreement was yeah I gotta figure because I know I'm tired I'm sick I'm trying to get this done for you because I love you all right so when we put it all together these are the things that we're gonna do I want you all to just read along ask yourself these questions you're looking at the structure you're looking at the order you're looking at the flashback you're looking at what these phrases are saying and doing and how they're creating tension and suspense so i just want y'all to go through take notes 
when I see you again on Thursday, I won't be there tomorrow, we'll review this. All right. Bye.